So we're going to get started. In just a minute, um, I just want to give everyone a little bit more time to log in, and then we'll begin the webinar. Okay, now as everyone and continues to log on, I'm just going to get started and welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, hi, I'm Maggie Nicholas Alexander, and I'm the Ovarian Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Welcome to our webinar, Rare Ovarian Cancers. Before we begin, I'm going to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that has been helping people through breast, ovarian, and uterine cancer for the last 45 years by offering the support of those who have been there. SHARE provides many services, including a helpline, support groups, and educational programs. All of our services are free to participants. For more information, visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When Dr. Fader finishes presenting, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You're welcome to submit questions during the uh, presentation through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. The chat section will be disabled. When asking questions, Remember that the presenter is unable to give specific medical advice, so please try to keep your questions more general in nature. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's program. Dr. Amanda Nichols Fader is an associate professor in the Johns Hopkins Medicine Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics. Dr. Fader is both the director of the Kelly Gynecologic Oncology Service and the director of the Center for Rare Gynecologic Cancers at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. She is recognized as a leading expert in rare gynecologic tumors including high-risk uterine and ovarian cancers. Dr. Fader has a special interest in uterine serous carcinoma, low-grade serous carcinoma of the ovary, and uterine sarcomas. She is, a she is on the National Cancer Institute NRG Oncology Rare Tumor Committee and she has published more than 170 peer-reviewed papers in medical journals, including 55 original research papers on ovarian cancer. And we're so excited to have her here today. Dr. Fader, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Maggie. I'm going to share my screen here. Can you all see my screen? Okay, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here today. And I'm going to be talking about a personalized approach to ovarian cancer, the one size uh, fits all strategy, fits all strategy no longer works uh, for women with with this disease and how we're really personalizing therapies. I have no financial relationships to disclose. Um, as Maggie was saying, I do have a very strong clinical and research interest in rare gynecologic cancers, especially the rare ovarian and uterine cancers, and in developing screening tools for ovarian cancer. And um, I am a member of the Rare Tumor Committee for the NRG, where we're uh, developing new clinical trials every day uh, for women with rare uh, ovarian cancers. So today, I'm hoping this is pretty interactive, but my, today my goal is to review the environmental and molecular genetic differences in the epithelial ovarian cancer subtypes, which we'll talk about in just a second, to define what personalized medicine is and how it relates to ovarian cancer care, and to understand those evidence supporting best treatment strategies for uh, women with rare epithelial tumors. 
And as all of you know, ovarian cancer is um, the second most common cancer uh, of, of the gynecology tract that's diagnosed in women in the United States. It's diagnosed in approximately 25,000 women annually in the US, way too many women. Um, and nearly 90% of these tumors are epithelial ovarian tumors. So just as a disclosure, I'm going to focus the talk today on the epithelial ovarian cancers, but if there are women on the call who, who have different types of rare ovarian cancers and you want to ask questions at the end, I'm very happy to talk about the different other types as well. Um, so the epithelial ovarian cancer is um, basically a cancer of the cells um, of the ovarian cortex or the outer covering of the ovary. We also have germ cell uh, tumors that can develop and sex cord tumors that can develop, but we're going to focus today on the the cortex or epithelial tumors. And we know with the when it comes to the epithelial tumors, there are four basic types. There's a couple of others as well, but we're going to focus today on the four basic types, and those are serous, endometrioid, mucinous, and clear cell cancers. And of these types, um, the serous are the by far the most common, um, they constitute about 75% of all epithelial ovarian cancers with high grade serous um, being the predominant histology that we see or, or cancer type and low grade serous, which we're gonna focus the talk on today, accounting for about 10% of all serous cancers. Now, because the high grade serous cancers are among the more common ovarian cancer types, we're not gonna discuss that too much in today's talk. However, if there are women again on the call who are survivors of high-grade serous carcinoma and you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Followed um, closely by clear cell cancers, the second most common type of epithelial um, subtype, as well as endometrioid. They're kind of neck and neck there at 11% each. And then mucinous is the most rare of the epithelial subtypes at 3%. So is ovarian cancer a single entity? Well, I don't have to tell any of you that the answer of course is no. Um, his, historically, women with epithelial ovarian cancer, however, have been treated similarly and lumped into the same surgery and chemo treatment trials, you know, irrespective of their, their tumor types. And so there's just been this age old debate in cancer medicine, you know, in clinical trials, do you lump women together with a bunch of rare different cancers and do a bigger trial under one umbrella um, and study them together? Or do you split out those um, patients and really study cancers uh, in their unique um, settings um, to determine what is going to be best for each woman and each individual cancer in that setting. And we've learned that probably the splitting approach, although more costly, is a much better way to go because there are many differences in genetic profiles and tumor biology and treatment responses among women with different tumor types um, and with uh, a clear distinction emerging between all these tumor types. So sorry for the, the gross picture, but this is a, this is a picture of a of an ovarian cancerous mass that's overtaken an ovary. Um, we know now that epithelial ovarian cancer is not one, but several distinct entities. So I like to think of this as many disease under one umbrella and really advances in the last 15 to 20 years in the understanding of ovarian malignancies, including defining the pathology criteria, how we diagnose these um, tumors under the microscope and the molecular uh, mutations and differences in these tumors um, have really helped us come a long way in improving treatments for women with rare ovarian cancers. Now there's two basic types of epithelial ovarian cancer. Type one is a uh, lower grade and uh, tumors meaning <clears throat> they, not, they don't tend to uh, multiply as rapidly and they uh, result in slower tumor growth, but they're still very, you know, we, we have to take them very seriously and they can be life-threatening. Um, and these types of tumors have genetic mutations in P10 and the KRAS genes, BRAF, SARC. We're going to talk about some of these in just a moment. And often these are women, uh, sometimes younger women, um, sometimes have earlier stage tumors, not always, but women with like the low-grade serous, the low-grade endometrioids, um, the, some of the mucinous tumors. Whereas the type two cancers are higher grade and have faster tumor growth. That would be like the high grade serous, some of the clear cell tumors or the high grade um, mucinous or endometrial tumors. And these tumors often have genetic mutations in a tumor suppressor gene called P53. P53 is the 
um, is the protein or the gene that's most commonly mutated in all human cancers. Um, and we see this more commonly in middle-aged or older women, and sometimes we see more advanced stage. Now we've talked about how the theme of this talk today is that one size doesn't fit all, and that is gonna be a rampant theme throughout my talk. Um, the problem is that most cancer treatments are designed for the average patient or a one size fits all approach that is successful for some patients, but not for others. And it was meeting an individual, uh, you know, it was a patient experience as a fellow when I was in training that led me to become a rare tumor researcher and expert in seeing that women with rare ovarian cancers, you know, didn't always respond well to these, these, you know, run of the mill or, out, you know, more routinely used therapies and that we needed to do better as physicians and scientists to move the needle on ovarian cancer outcomes and survival. Um, and the, the reason for that is that even though, um, you know, these, we're talking about rare cancers here, every woman with rare cancer is not only incredibly important, but some women with rare cancers might experience poor outcomes clinically or poor survival because we haven't had the studies, you know, as many studies to determine the best treatment options for these women. So it was a real imperative for me as a GYN oncologist to focus my career on helping uh, women uh, who are diagnosed with the rare tumors. And not only that, but, you know, helping to come up with better therapies. And one of the big initiatives that we've had in the last, you know, five to eight years is precision medicine. And this is an innovative approach to disease prevention and treatment that takes into account differences in, in an individual's genes, environments, and lifestyles. And it involves tailoring medical treatment to the individual characteristics of each patient instead of using a generic treatment strategy for all women. Um, and so the ability to classify individuals into subpopulations that differ um, in their susceptibilities um, or in the tumor biologies or prognosis of the disease they may develop, and it, certainly in how they respond differently to treatments was a game changer in not only rare ovarian cancers, but for people with rare disorders of any type, um, because then we can really concentrate on therapies um, that will be very unique to the individual, um, identify which women are gonna benefit, which will not, so that we can spare those who may not um, tolerate uh, a certain treatment, the side effects and the expense, and utilize a different approach in, in that population of women. Um, the Precision Medicine Initiative um, basically was led initially by um, former President Obama um, and now Biden, in, you know, in 2015. And at that time, the president called for the, the National Cancer Institute to invest in, you know, $250 million to support this initiative, which included several components um, to, to try to study, you know, cancers and other uh, rare disorders. We have a precision medicine initiative at Johns Hopkins. It's called the Precision Medicine Centers of Excellence. And we have yet to establish one in gynecology. We are working on that um, uh, very avidly, um, but there are several cancer precision medicine centers of excellence. And the, the idea here is um, you have two different patients with the same disease. Let's say uh, we had two women with clear cell carcinoma of the ovary. And you study the woman, her clinical, um, her clinical presentation of the disease, uh, what treatments she may have initially responded to or didn't respond to, and then you study the tumor itself, and you can do um, studies of the mutations of the proteins in the tumors and the genes to study, ah, is there a drug that we can use to target a specific mutation in this woman's particular tumor type that might inhibit the growth of her tumor and help her have a much better survival and better quality of life? And you can see in this example, even though these two women may have the same disease, that they had two very different mutations and we use two different drugs to target their cancers depending on those mutations. So this is just an example of how we use precision medicine at Johns Hopkins and at other centers. And it's important because up until very recently, up until the last five years, the National um, Comprehensive Cancer Network or NCCN, which is the governing, um, one of the governing bodies that helps define what are the standards of care for, for cancer treatments across all kinds of cancers. When you looked at the guidelines for epithelial ovarian cancer, it was the same for everyone. Depend, you know, it didn't matter that you had low grade or mucinous or endometrioid. We were all lumped under this treatment umbrella recommendation where women with advanced disease would undergo debulking surgery, and then everybody would get carbotaxol or cisplatin taxol um, 
some would get it IV, some would get it in the abdomen, but it was pretty, pretty similar approach. And although carbotaxol is an extraordinarily important backbone of ovarian cancer treatment, we've learned since then that some women don't respond at all to carbotaxol and would benefit from other treatments or carbotaxol is useful, but we have added some things to it as well to make it even better. Um, so we're going to talk about that throughout this talk. So let's first talk about um, low-grade serous ovarian carcinoma. And I, I hope that there are some women on the call with um, uh, who've been diagnosed with this so that we can you know, really get into the meat of this. But low-grade serous, again, is one of the more common rare tumors. And um, really in the last 15 years, it was pathologists at both MD Anderson and Johns Hopkins who helped establish what's called the two-tiered histologic criteria. And that is that um, they looked at what we call low-grade tumors, again, tumors that look a little more um, well-behaved under the microscope. They're not as likely to divide as rapidly. That's called mitotic index. Um, they don't look as abnormal. There's not as much what we call atypia or you know, funky-looking cells under the microscope. And um, they had very, these lower grade serous tumors had very different mutations in the tumors in these genes called KRAS and BRAF. And then they had ERPR, many, many of you know, may know what that means. That stands for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. And women with breast cancer or with ovarian cancers, um, we, we do study the tumors to find out if you have um, expression of these estrogen and progesterone receptors. And remember, estrogen and progesterone are two of the most important hormones that the ovary produces in the woman. And accounts for so many different important roles from helping us with sexual health, metabolism, cardiac health, better sleep. So estrogen you know, is really important, but too much estrogen, or if your tumors are fueled by estrogen or progesterone, can be a problem. And so it's really important to know about this. And we're gonna talk about that a lot in just a second. We also know that the low-grade tumors have a different um, precursor, meaning um, that usually we don't go from a benign cell to a cancerous cell. There's something that happens in between that's a precursor event, um, and that is the serous borderline tumor, and it develops from the actual ovary. Well, we've learned with the high-grade serous tumors that they're much more uh, atypical under the microscope. They grow more rapidly. Again, they have that P53 mutation, very different mutation profile than the low-grade disease. And these precursor lesions start in the tube, in the fallopian tubes. The vast majority of high-grade serous ovarian cancers aren't actually ovarian cancers. They're fallopian tube cancers that spread to the ovary, okay? So we know with low-grade serous cancers that these tumors are more, you know, two to three times more likely to express estrogen and progesterone receptors than the high-grade tumors. We also know that um, uh, we've talked about some of these bullets already here. We know that women with the genetic mutations BRCA1 and 2 don't happen as commonly in women with the low-grade tumors as they do for the high-grade tumors, but they can exist. Uh, we know that women with low-grade tumors are often diagnosed at a much younger age and have a relatively long overall survival compared to women with high-grade. However, um, what I've done a lot of my research on is that the problem here is that low-grade serous carcinoma has much lower response rates to conventional chemotherapy. And if not treated you know, appropriately, can have the same, you know, can have very poor survival outcomes. So getting treatment from a specialist who knows about low-grade serous carcinoma can help with that. We know that low-grade serous tumors are best treated with surgery um, because they're so slow growing. Surgery is probably one of the most important things we do in trying to remove all of the tumors at surgery if possible, or almost all of the tumors is, is always the goal. I did a study um, uh, through the National Cancer Institute and the Gynecologic Oncology Group where we looked at a clinical trial that had been performed in women. This was one of those big trials before we started splitting out women with the rare tumors. And this trial included about 189 women with low-grade serous carcinoma. And we looked at what were factors that were related to best survival outcomes for these women. And we found that residual disease status after primary surgery, meaning how much cancer you had remaining after your primary surgery on the CT scan, 
was independently and significantly associated with survival. So that told us, you know, we really have to try to get as much of the disease out. Sometimes it's not possible even for the best surgeons to get all of the disease out if the disease is in tough spots. But the, the effort of trying to get out most of the disease is really important here. And we saw some big differences in survival outcome, you know, based on that. We also know that that can be a factor at second surgery or third surgery or fourth surgery, as many women with low-grade serous may have multiple surgeries throughout their lifetime. So again, the goal is to try to get out as much surgery as possible. Well, what about doing chemo after surgery? Well, we now know after studying this disease for several years, and this is from work at MD Anderson, that low-grade serous is actually pretty resistant to the carbotaxel chemotherapy. About 20% of women or so will respond to this chemotherapy, but the majority won't. So we have to get a little bit creative here about how we approach treatment. And one of the things we're doing at Johns Hopkins that I've been doing since 2011 is um, we have treated women with advanced low-grade serous cancer after radical debulking surgery with hormonal therapy alone. Um, we actually, many of us who have, were, you know, stopped using chemotherapy in this population and we're testing whether the addition of hormone therapy, like an aromatase inhibitor, um, such as arimidex or letrozole by itself would be enough if a woman had had a great surgical outcome and we'd gotten most or all of the disease out. And we continued the therapy um, thereafter. Um, that led to two, um, you know, important um, papers that came out in the medical literature, one from MD Anderson by Dr. Gershenson and all Dr. Gershenson, as many of you may know, is a major leader in this field. Um, and he had a trial um, or a study, excuse me, a retrospective study where they looked at women after primary surgery with low grade serous and they got chemotherapy, carbotaxel, and then it was followed by hormone therapy, often with a drug letrozole, for example. And what they found was that the women who got the hormone therapy with the chemo had a much longer uh, remission period or what's called progression-free survival than those women who just got the chemotherapy and surgery. And that was about a median uh, average of 26.4 months of remission versus 64.9 months of remission. So that was a really big difference. We then looked at our um, analysis. Again, we were just, we weren't doing chemo after surgery. We were just doing the, the aromatase inhibitor like letrozole. And we combined our data with Cleveland Clinic who was also doing the same thing we were. And this was an initial study of 27 patients. So it was a small study, but it gave us some important information that after a follow-up of almost four years, um, only about a, you know, a one fifth of women had experienced a recurrence at that point. And uh, the median or the average remission period was not yet reached and the average overall survival was not yet known that most women were still alive and most women had not had a recurrence after about three to four years of follow-up. And so this gave us some information to then um, think about, you know, what's the best way forward here after primary surgery? We know the surgery is important. Do we do chemo with hormones or just hormones by itself? And that led to the development of this clinical trial called NRG GY19. GY stands for gyne. And this is through the, again, the National Cancer Institute. And Dr. Gershenson and I um, are spearheading this study and it's an international trial. It's the first trial in the world that was developed for women who are newly diagnosed with advanced low-grade serous carcinoma. And it's basically um, a trial where women are randomized after surgery to get either chemo followed by that letrozole hormone therapy or, or letrozole by itself after surgery. And so our hypothesis is that perhaps the letrozole uh, treatment will be enough and maybe we can spare chemotherapy in some of these women, but we're also studying their, the women's tumors to try to understand, you know, are there, who are the women who will benefit from chemo? Because if they will benefit, we wanna give it to them. Who are the women who aren't gonna benefit? So we're doing a lots of like uh, analyses to, to try to determine that. And then this is the study design. And this trial is open and enrolling now. Um, we have about 72 patients enrolled worldwide. And we hope to get some important data to share with everyone, hopefully within the next three years or so. 
Now for women who have, you know, there are many women with low grade serous cancer may experience a recurrence at some point in time. And the good news is that there's a lot of data coming out about different strategies we can use to treat recurrence. And there's two recent clinical trials that were performed, one of them called the Milo Engot OV11 study. And this was a study of a MEK inhibitor um, called binimitinib, I have a trouble pronouncing that, versus physician's choice chemo, meaning the physician got to choose what they gave the patient. For women who had persistent or, or a relapse or a recurrent low-grade serous carcinoma, I'm gonna show you that those results in just a second. There's also an active study open now looking at MEK inhibitor in combination with a FAC inhibitor. These are all, FAC and MEK are proteins um, along um, signal, uh, uh, along growth uh, cascades in cells that give the signal to the cell to multiply and divide. If we can inhibit some of these growth signals in a cell, we can potentially stop that tumor growth or slow it way down. Um, so this trial is open um, at many centers and led by Rachel Grisham from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Now in this this tri this bitnit bitnit minute trial, excuse me, there was no difference seen in in remission rates or progression free survival overall in the patients. However, when they did some analysis of the actual tumors, and remember we talked about that KRAS mutation before that's common in the low grade serous tumors, women who had the KRAS mutations experienced in significantly improved survival, uh, you know, of almost eight months compared to women who um, did not have that KRAS mutation. So we think that this drug might be important in women who have that specific mutation. There was then another trial that was performed. Um, oh, and this is by the way, the study design of that trial. The binimitinib was compared to either doxel, taxol, or topotecan. So physicians and patients had the choice of which drug to go on there. And again, the bin binimitinib did better in women who had that KRAS mutation in their tumors. There was a very similar trial conducted by Dr. Gershenson called GOG281. Again, it was a randomized study looking at a MEK inhibitor. This time it was called trimitinib versus physician's choice of chemotherapy. And it was very similar choices as with the Milo study, except you can see that we also allowed tamoxifen on that study as well. And when you looked at these results, interestingly, it didn't matter if the women had a KRAS mutation, those who got the MEK inhibitor had a longer uh, remission period and a longer progression-free survival of um, you know, several months, about six months. Um, and this was statistically significant. And they also found that overall survival in had increased by almost a year, um, but just missed achieving um, significance. So they're gonna continue to study that. So um, there's some exciting, um, exciting treatment options here that, are, are, you know, that we can use now um, in women with recurrence. There's also several combination strategies we're looking at, looking at hormone therapy with uh, different combination strategies like CDK4-6 inhibitors, such as ribocyclib. This is an ongoing study. So we have like over four or five trials nationally right now that are open just for women with low-grade serous carcinoma, which was unheard of five years ago. Um, and many of these trials are what we call positive. We're seeing positive results from the newer newer drugs. We've had, I've had some patients who have stayed on these drugs because they've done so well. We haven't taken them off and they've survived, you know, two or more years doing great. Haven't had a disease recurrence. Some women have had a disease recurrence after a certain amount of time on the study, but every woman's different. And we're, we're trying to see who will most benefit from these. Okay, let's shift gears now to talk about mucinous adenocarcinomas. Um, these represent, um, you know, less than three to five percent of all epithelial ovarian cancers. The good news is that eighty-three percent are early stage or stage one because these tumors get really, really big before they start to spread to other areas of the body, and so um, women feel these symptoms um, more commonly while the tumors are still early stage. Um, Fortunately, the vast majority are also one-sided or unilateral. They don't occur in both ovaries in most cases. And these tumors also really express that KRAS mut mutation. They also express a protein called HER2. HER stands for human epidermal growth factor. HER2 is also really important in a couple of other types of uterine cancers, as well as breast cancers. Um, and an antibody drug 
was developed called trastuzumab. Some of you may know it as Herceptin um, that was used to target this particular um, overexpressed uh, receptor. Um, so we know with mucinous cancers that a routine approach to treatment with chemo doesn't work. These tumors don't behave like the serous tumors and they are fairly unlikely to respond really well to carbotaxel. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. And the, the gynecologic oncology group at the, at the NCI, um, the National Cancer Institute developed this forearm, you know, randomized control study looking at women with mucinous ovarian cancers. And basically it was, it was carbotaxel with and without bevacizumab, otherwise known as Avastin, which many of you recognize or, or have, have had experience with. Um, to oxaliplatin and capsidabine, which is a GI, a gastrointestinal chemo regimen that we give to women with say colon cancers, for example. And they also tested that with and without bevacizumab in women with stages two through four or recurrent mucinous tumors. However, the, the sad news is that um, because it was a rare tumor type and it had four arms, we had a lot of difficulty getting enough patients enrolled. This was Dr. Michael Fromovitz who ran this study from MD Anderson and there were not enough patients enrolled um, in this certain amount of time. And so the trial was unfortunately terminated and no results were available. However, since that time, Dr. Fromovitz persisted and his team and our team joined forces and we studied this question sort of retrospectively. So not in a clinical trial, but we studied it in women who we treated. And at Hopkins and at, at Anderson, we've always felt like, you know, perhaps women with mucinous tumors might be better served by getting the GI chemo regimen instead of the conventional carbotaxel. So we studied that effect. And in the 52 women we studied, 31% of women had the grade three or the higher grade, more aggressive tumors. About a fourth of women had FIGO, um, basically stage three or four more advanced stage disease. 86% had an optimal uh, surgical resection to what we thought was no grossly visible cancer. And patients who got the GI regimen were more likely to also receive bevacizumab. And after we did an analysis of this, we saw that remission rates as well as overall survival rates favored the women who had received the GI regimen with or without the bevacizumab. Um, and so this is a small study of only 52 women, but allowed us to preliminarily answer some questions that the larger GOG study couldn't answer. Um, and this was published in um, the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, a couple of years ago. And um, now and it's in the NCCN guidelines to cons you know, consider a GI regimen. Um, and if you did, if you got carbotaxel upfront for the treatment of this tumor, you could still get you know, lots of GI regimen options downstream should you need that. And again, we have molecular targets here. So we can consider drugs like Herceptin, Lepatinib, um, if, you, if the tumor has a KRAS mutation, consider a MEK inhibitor or other similar inhibitors. Avastin, we think, may have some general activity in these tumors as well. So there's more and more emerging treatment targets. Uh, one that I forgot to mention on the slide is SARC, SRC. Uh, it's another non-tyrosine receptor, um, which is on the surface of the cells. And there are now some SARC inhibitors that are being developed. So lots of great options developing here. What about clear cell tumors? Um, we know that this represents um, about um, less than 5% of all uh, uh, epithelial ovarian cancers. They may arise in endometriosis though in 70% of cases. So endometriosis is a really strong risk factor. 80% also present just like using this as a unilateral large mass. So many of these are gonna be early stage as well. Unfortunately, clear cell tumors may be more associated with blood clots in the leg, legs and lungs. They release a substance into the bloodstream we think is uh, prothrombotic or pro predisposes people to blood clots. I think also because the masses are so large and heavy and grow as like one solid mass that they can sit on the blood vessels and slow down the, the, the return of the venous blood up to the heart and that can lead to PE, PEs or DVTs as well. We know that these tumors express vascular endothelial growth factor um, more than some of the other ovarian cancers. This is something that that bevacizumab and avastin addresses, and also that they have MET and AKT gene amplification, which make them really interesting targets for other newer targeted therapies. 
One of the most common mutations we see in clear cell tumors though is ARID1A. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit as well. This is what a clear cell tumor looks like under the microscope. And even though these are less common in the United States, I don't know how many of you knew that clear cell ovarian cancer represents more than 25% of all ovarian cancers in Asia and especially in Japanese women. So for women who are of Japanese American or Asian American descent, you know, they may have a higher risk factor for this type of subtype. I'm in a combined discussion of clear cell and endometrioid together because some of the treatments are similar-ish. Um, so endometrioid carcinoma, about 11% of all um, epithelial ovarian tumors. This tumor is the one, um, just like low grade, that's very likely to strongly express estrogen and progesterone receptors. So about 80% similar to the low grade serous carcinomas. These also arise in endometriosis. So we're seeing a theme here. Endometriosis, for those who may not know, is when the menstrual, uh, when you have your menstrual cycle, for those women who are, um, you know, is still pre premenopausal, um, usually the, the menstruation uh, and the blood flow should flow through the cervix into the vagina and be eliminated from the body. But sometimes that menstrual blood th flow can come up backwards through the fallopian tubes and implant itself on the ovaries or on tissues around the ovaries. And it can, um, in some cases, if there's mutations in the endometriosis, um, it can go a little haywire and can be atypical and can event sometimes in some cases lead to cancerous growth. Um, these tumors tend to have a better prognosis than the high grade serous tumors. Um, and again, mostly because uh, the good news is many of them are early stage, 84% are stage one to two. Um, but they may, the, the downside is that it may not be as chemo sensitive as serous tumors, meaning that the traditional chemotherapies may not work as well. So let's talk now about immunotherapy, because I know there's always a lot of questions about that. And this has applications to, especially to the clear cells and the endometrioid tumors. We know that cancer is ultimately a gene mutation disorder in that humans develop countless mutations or errors um, in their cells and the DNA or the genetic makeup of each of our cells um, that occur throughout our lifetimes. And so we have you know, millions and millions of cells in our body and many of them turn over, right? Think about the skin, the skin on your, your face or your hands. You, know, you don't have the same skin cells that you had when you were 16 or when you were 32. You know, it, it, it turns over and new cells rapidly develop. And so cells have to undergo countless cycles of cell division in order to replenish um, the cells in, in each organ. But we also know that cancer is ultimately an immunology disorder, meaning that tumors have developed a very good way of avoiding detection by the immune system. So let's talk first about gene and protein mutations in cancer. We recognize that an important development in cancer research in the last 30 years is the recognition that all human cancers, every single one of them, result from mutations in a limited set of genes or proteins. And we have different ways, I've been talking a lot about mutations today and, and drugs that can target mutations. So we're gonna take a little step back and talk, well, what's the difference between genetic and molecular testing in ovarian cancer? Well, genetic testing is a type of medical test that identifies changes in chromosomes or genes that are inherited. So genes are where your, your genetic makeup are stored, your DNA, and that's found in the nucleus of all of, of your cells. And these are inherited and passed along through generations of families. And those are, you know, individuals, for example, who inherit a BRCA mutation, a RADC51 mutation, those who have Lynch syndrome, who might have something called microsatellite instability. And we can use different companies. Let's, I don't have a preference and I'm not here to talk about commercial aspects, but Myriad and Vitae, all kinds of different companies do genetic testing. So we can determine, did you develop your cancer because you have an inherited risk? And, and we're going to talk about that, why that's important in just a second. Um, with molecular testing, um, that is when we actually do a test on the actual tumor cells, not on your own cells, like your blood cells or cells from your mouth, but your, but your tumor cell and identify changes that may have occurred in genes or proteins and tumors that are not inherited. These are just spontaneous changes. And we can use something called next gen sequencing or next generation sequencing to really, um, look at sequencing genomes or genetic material in tumors 
and in patients at high speed and low cost to identify those specific mutations in the tumor. And that's like when, if you have your tumor sent to foundation medicine or Keras, or maybe your center does that next gen sequencing right at, right at the cancer um, uh, building. Um, so these are different ways we can determine whether you have a mutation. But the problem is that tumors are really, really tricky. And they develop the ability to evade the immune system, right? Because our immune systems are usually really good at attacking foreign invaders like COVID-19, you know, bacteria, um, and even some small tumors. It's, it's theorized that, that we develop multiple cancers throughout a lifetime, but that our immune system is usually pretty good at clearing it and we never know it. Um, but occasionally a tumor will escape detection for the immune system and then it grows and proliferates and can become a tumor and that then can be detectable and needs to be treated. And one of the ways that tumors evade the immune system is that they secrete this substance, um, program death one, you know, this substance that inhibits basically the immune cells. These are your T helper cells here. And this, think of this as like the army, the US government, the army, it's like your frontline responders, your frontline military force that's protecting you know, the, the country. This is like the, what the immune system T helper cells are in your body. They are your frontline defense. But the tumor secrete this substance that basically shuts down the T helper cells or inactivates them. So it's like, there's nothing to see here, folks. It's a normal cell, even though they're not a normal cell. And I don't know about you, but I'm a big Star Trek fan. I'm kind of a dork that way, but, um, but I like to think of the Star Trek analogy. And this is Captain Kirk with Scotty and they're looking out into the cosmos and they don't see anything there, right? But for any of you who are Star Trek fans, you know that one of their enemies are the Romulans, right? And the Romulans had a cloaking device on their ship and they were able to stay hidden until they were right on top of the Star Trek Starship Enterprise. And then they would start firing and it would really result in Captain Kirk going ballistic every time. Um, and this is what tumors basically do. They cloak themselves in this inhibitory, uh, with these inhibitory proteins so that they remain unrecognized for the immune system. The modern day immune therapies that have been developed that you've been hearing a lot about are all about inhibiting the inhibitory substance that those tumors are releasing. So they're called PD-1 or program death inhibitors. So basically they don't allow the tumor to inhibit or shut down those T helper cells, which keeps them activated and awake. And when you have tumors here that may have lots of mutations on the outside surface of their cell, it allows a T helper cell to recognize them as foreign and activate and attack them. So this is how the different um, Im immune, this is a very crude way of describing this very complex science, um, but PD-1 inhibitors are what um, have been most studied um, in the rare ovarian cancers, including nivolumab and pembro or pembrolizumab. So is immunotherapy something that can be used in ovarian cancer? In some cases, yes and potentially especially in the clear cell and endometria carcinomas. Um, we know that tumors that express um, the, uh, or that have the abnormal um, microsatellite instability in their tumors are something called mismatch repair deficiency, which is basically um, there is a problem in the enzymes of the cell, of the tumor cell that doesn't allow it to uh, repl replicate its DNA in a, in a reliable way we can harness those weaknesses in those cancer cells if they have these types of mutations with what we call those checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab and nivolumab. And pembrolizumab immunotherapy actually was the first drug in the history of the Food and Drug Administration that got approval, not for a specific type of cancer, so not for like lung cancer or colon cancer, but for tissue that had these mutations in mismatch repair deficiency or microsatellites instability. So it could be, it could, it, it's a, it was approved for women with uterine cancers, ovarian cancers, lung, colon, pancreas, if they had this specific mutation. And the interesting um, thing is that in clear cell carcinomas, as well as in endometrial carcinomas, there is a higher likelihood of having those mutations than in any of the other types of the rare tumors. 
So each, each of these unique features of these tumors allows us to target them in different ways. And right now we have a clinical trial open through the NCI as NRG GY16 led by Dr. Lillian Yen, my, my Canadian colleague from Toronto. And they're studying this pembrolizumab, the immunotherapy with the addition of a different targeted therapy, epicatastat, and women with recurrent clear cell carcinoma. And we have a couple of other clear cell carcinoma trials that are open as well, or that are going to be opening in the next year. Um, some of them include immunotherapy with other combination strategies. Some are, we're looking at completely different mechanisms. Um, and one of them is to target ARID1A. And this is actually the most prevalent mutation of all in clear cell carcinoma. We see it, in, it also in women, in about 40% of women with the endometrial ovarian carcinomas. And at Johns Hopkins, through Dr. E. Ming Shi, she, Dr. Stephanie Gayard, and others, they are studying potential targets for ARID 1A mutations that we can use um, to, um, to essentially um, uniquely target these types of tumors. Um, so these are being developed right now. And I just wanted to let you know, there's a lot of flurry of activity going on in research to, uh, to catch up uh, in, with, with, for women with clear cell and endometroid cancers. The other thing that's important to remember with endometrial tumors, again, as I said earlier, they're very rich in estrogen or progesterone. So using aromatase inhibitors, or progesterone. I'm sorry that the phone is ringing right now upstairs. I'm at my, where my family's visiting my folks right now and they need to answer the phone. Um, but basically um, we can use anti-hormone or anti-estrogens or anti-progesterones in the endometrial tumors, especially just as we do with the low-grade serous tumors. So tamoxifen, letrozoles, um, you know, megase, those can all be used rationally to treat recurrences of endometrial tumors as well. And, um, and the NCCN now says that women with stage 1B or 1C tumors do not necessarily need chemotherapy that could potentially just be observed after surgery or could receive hormone therapy. So we're, we're really studying like who can avoid chemotherapy and do well or do better and, you know, not have the side effects of chemo, which women will really benefit from chemo and how can we identify those women? And then really checking that mismatch repair deficiency to determine if a woman who has a relapse cancer would be a candidate for immunotherapy can be a game changer as well. The last thing I just wanted to point out is we're also, um, although we're trying to do less sort of lumping and do more splitting, I'm gonna contradict that a little bit in talking about, uh, to, to wrap up my talk, basket and umbrella trials. Um, instead of just putting all women with ovarian cancer into one trial and not studying their, the unique characteristic of women's trial, umbrella and basket trials go one step further. Um, so an umbrella trial is where you have a woman with tumors of the same type. So let's say you have women with mucinous ovarian cancer, but you study their different gene mutations. So you do that next gen sequencing or that molecular testing up front, and you, you give them different treatments in that umbrella trial, depending on the type of mutation they have. So see how that's very different than a big lumping trial where you just put all women uh, with ovarian cancer of different types and give them the same treatment. This is take one cancer and test what's unique even about in those women with the same types of cancer and give them different treatments depending on those differences. Um, conversely, a basket trial is where you can take women with multiple different tumor types, but instead of just giving them all the same treatment, you ensure that they all have the same genetic or molecular mutation. And so instead of treating a woman based on, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to just treat all clear cells, uh, and all uterine serous and all mucinous tumors exactly the same way. We're going to take women who have clear cell ovarian and renal cell clear uh, renal uh, clear cells. So women with kidney cancers that are clear cell and ovarian cancer clear cell, we're going to test to see if they have the same mutations. And if they do, then we're going to study the same treatment for those types of women. So these basket trials look at different types of tumors, but, but they all have the same kind of mutation or genetic profile. Uh, and then we study the responses to that. And one of the examples of this that's open now is called GOG3051. This is a phase two platform study evaluating the safety and efficacy of what's called biomarker driven therapies. Biomarker is mutation, another word for mutation. So we're looking at mutation specific therapies instead of tumor specific therapies. 
in women with persistent or recurrent rare epithelial ovarian cancers. And this, we're very excited about this trial because it's gonna allow us to take this one step further. So in conclusion, ovarian cancer is not a single disease. It consists of multiple entities that require a nuanced individualized approach to treatment. Personalized medicine allows for individualization and prevent, potential prevention and treatment strategies for women with ovarian cancer that are based on differences in molecular, genetic, or lifestyle. Um, and this personalized medicine, while it's in its nascent stages, um, in that not all mutations we identify, do we have a drug that's what we call actionable, that we have a treatment to, to, to address that specific mutation, but we're actively and avidly studying this. And I just want you to know that we're making significant progress in the last decade with, for outcomes of women with rare ovarian tumors. There's been multiple ovarian, uh, rare ovarian tumors trials that have been positive in the last 10 years. And the NCI and the American Cancer Society reported for the first time, I think it was in 2019, that we, it had been 30 years since we'd seen a major improvement in overall survival in ovarian cancer, and we're starting to see those gains. So thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fader. That was amazing. You covered a ton of ground. Um, and we already have a lot of questions. So we'll start the Q&A shortly. You can still submit questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get through as many as possible, but we may not be able to due to time, time constraints. Um, Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so this first question question goes back to low grade serous and it, it says, are there any tests or markers that indicate if someone is more likely or not to respond positively to chemo? So that's a great question. Um, that is a holy grail type question that we're trying to answer right now. <laughs> So one of the one of the mutations we've talked about today is that p53 mutation. That's one of the more common mutations we see in human cancers, and the high grade serous tumors express that p53, and the low most of the low grade serous do not. But we actually do p53 testing in all, all women with low grade serous cancers because we think that p53 may be a marker of more aggressivity or, you know. Um, more rapid potential growth pattern for a tumor. And so you occasionally in about eight to 10% of women might find women with low grade serous who also have a P53 mutation, it's, it's unusual. But in those, those might be the women that most benefit from the combined approach, you know, chemo and um, hormone therapy. The standard of care is, it can be either, you know, chemo plus hormones or hormones alone. Right now, the NCCN allows either approach. So if you're a woman who got chemo and hormones or just got hormones alone, don't fear. Like that's what our trial that Dr. Gerson and I are doing is trying to answer. Is one of those approaches better than the other and who might benefit? But is that P53 might be an important marker to help us distinguish that. Great. And so this next question, okay. So if you experience disease progression while on Faslodex, is it safe to assume that hormone inhibitors won't work in the low-grade setting? What about combining it with another drug? Great question. So um, one mutation I didn't talk about to, due to lack of time today is ESR1 mutations or estrogen um, receptor alpha mutations. And we know from the breast cancer literature, because a lot of women with breast cancer have estrogen positive tumors, just like low grade serous carcinomas. And um, in breast cancer, ESR, if a woman has an ESR1 mutation, it means that she may have developed a resistance to select types of hormone replacement therapy. But depending on those mutations may have benefit from other types of hormone replacement therapy. And we've just started studying this, Dr. Stephanie Gayard and myself and others are studying this mutation in low-grade serous to try to make predictions about, you know, and we've had some patients who did really poorly on a, so like an aromatase inhibitor like letrozole, and then went on Faslodex or XMS stain or something and had, you know, months or years of disease control on this other hormone agent. But you're right. When you do develop resistance to things like Faslodex, you can then com potentially combine it with other agents like CDK4 inhibitors, 
um, other targeted agents um, like Avastin, for example, and these have not been well studied yet. Um, there's a couple of ongoing clinical trials in low-grade disease, and we should have better answers for you on that question within the next year and a half or so. Great. And so I know you didn't talk about uh, ovarian carcinosarcoma, but we did get a question about that, about where does that fit in here? And then uh, another question to that was, what does research tell us about delaying or preventing recurrence of carcinosarcoma? Another excellent question. I'm sorry, I will remember to put that in my talk if I'm invited back. <laughs> I apologize. I did not mean to exclude car ovarian carcinosarcoma survivors. Um, we tend to treat those similarly to the high-grade serous carcinomas. They tend to be a little bit trickier to treat in that sometimes their response rates to carbotaxel aren't exactly the same as those with the high-grade serous carcinoma. And so for patients in our practice, we check, we do that NGS or next-gen sequencing right away on those tumors. Um, and sometimes we'll add other agents right away to, to therapies in the upfront setting right after their initial surgery. So um, if they have um, that mismatch repair deficiency, for example, we may add immunotherapy to the mix, or if they have, sometimes they can have um, HER2, that HER2 um, expression that we talked about where drugs uh, like the antibody Herceptin can be useful. I did a study looking at um, um, the uterine carcinosarcomas and the uterine serous carcinomas, and we found a high rate of HER2 positivity in those tumors. And we're now studying that in women with ovarian carcinosarcoma. So sometimes we can add that antibody Herceptin to the mix. It's all about personalization as well. And if you can get the tumor profiled and find, you know, carbotaxel plus type therapies where you, you know, you can gain more ground with, with really targeting the, the tumor mutations. I think, you know, we're going to get, get somewhere with this disease. Great. Uh, and so the next question, and that's, and that goes to a lot about what you've talked throughout this talk um, in terms of um, treating the patient rather than lumping them into the standard of care protocol. But that being said, how would you suggest that a patient respectfully challenge the standard of care if they feel that their individual circumstances are not being considered by their medical team? Really good question. Um, so that's where I think a second opinion, uh, you know, ha first having a, a thoughtful discussion with your provider. I mean, I think the most important thing we can do as physicians is listen to our patients. And I learn things from my patients all the time. Um, they bring me articles and different <laughs> studies and um, whether it's about you know, complementary medicine or about some new study and new drug. Um, so if you feel like your provider is not listening to you, you deserve to be heard. And I recommend you know, potentially seeking a second opinion at um, a center where they do have rare tumor specialists. If, if your provider is not a you know, rare tumor specialist or and, and even if they are, it's always useful. And I am not offended. I, I, sometimes if I have a patient with a really, really, really rare tumor, I might send them myself for a second opinion at another major center just so that we can achieve more consensus. I like to talk to my colleagues around the country, like Grisham and Gershenson and people all over who are studying rare tumors, because they might have a trial open that I don't, that my, and I've sent my patients for clinical trials at other centers if I think they're gonna benefit. So we, we can't be selfish as providers. We have to do what's, I think, what's best for patients and not be insulted if one seeks a second opinion, especially when it comes to rare diseases, but advocate for yourself and get that opinion if you feel you aren't being heard. Great, that's great advice. So this question asks whether, so it's, it's sort of two different questions, but one is, is it possible to have low grade and high grade ovarian cancer at the same time? Yeah. And so uh, how, how yeah, can you treat ahead. both simultaneously? Both yeah. sides simultaneously. We were, this is a very timely question. We were just talking about this at our tumor multidisciplinary tumor board conference with our pathologist two weeks ago. It's a very rare entity, but it's it's described in the literature. I've only seen it a handful of times and I'm talking five or six times in my career. Um, so it's super rare, but you have to, you have to 
you know, if you have the tumor studied at a, a major center with expertise in low grade and high grade pathology, and this is what they come out with, and there's both entities involved, you've got to target both entities in your treatment strategy. And so you personalize it, you're just doing it, you know, it's like you're two fist in it a little bit. Um, so this might be a you know, the kind of scenario where, where chemo is going to be very important, but targeted hormonal agents and targeted Avastin type agents and newer, you know, MEK inhibitors and strategies kind of combining the best of both worlds is going to be the best strategy. Great. And I, let me see if there was anything else to their question about that. Uh, okay. And so they just sort of followed up with that thing that their sister had been diagnosed with low grade um, but has brain metastasis, which points towards high grade type. But then a person followed up beneath that and says that they have low grade serous and unbiased brain tumors. How rare is brain met with low grade serous? It's pretty rare, but it can happen. And I, I've seen it a few, you know, I, I these tumor, as a rare tumor specialist, none of these tumors are rare to me, but, <laughs> you know, but but we see this, it's, it's unusual though. Um, so, you know, just making sure that you're on a therapy, you know, I can't give medical advice about that situation, but making sure mm -hmm. one's on a medical therapy that crosses the blood brain, brain barrier is really important. Not all chemos or agents do that. Um, sometimes radiation is very useful in the treatment of, of brain mets. And we use that, you know, quite frequently in the treatment of isolated ovarian cancer brain meds. I had one patient, she had a carcinosarcoma of the ovary and a high grade serous uh, mixed tumor. She, you know, had a huge surgery seven years ago with me and has recurred like three times in the brain and nowhere else. So it keeps having these isolated recurrences that are treated with radiation and surgery. And we've been able to spare her the effects of chemo because it doesn't come back anywhere else. So it's, you know, again, taking a personalized approach to brain mats is really important and just make sure that your rare tumor specialist is helping with, with you know, working with the neuro, neuro-oncology team to devise the best treatments. Great. And I know we have so many questions, but I think we only have time for one more. Um, so I do, I do want to ask this question because Again, it's a, another rare type that we weren't able to touch, touch in in the presentation. So this question is, what are currently the best treatment options for non-gestational choriocarcinoma? Carcinocarcinoma. Carcinocarcinoma. Choriocarcinoma. Yeah, choriocarcinoma. Yeah. <laughs> it, I have a hard time saying it too. Um, <laughs> That is going to be a pretty long answer because it depends on the scenario and it depends on where, you know, what stage of disease. I don't know if that individual, I would be happy to try to provide some written answers to some of our colleagues who are on the, uh, and, and survivors who are on the call if, if I can. Um, but that it really depends on whether one is in recurrence or, uh, you know, upfront um, how, how we, how we treat that. Um, it's very difficult tumor to treat. There's no doubt. Immunotherapy though is being studied very actively in this disease. And so there is, there's a lot of hope on the horizon for the gestational and non-gestational uh, choriocarcinomas in terms of utilizing these newer drugs. Great. And I just like um, coming in the, the question box, we're just getting so many thank yous to you and how great this was and how helpful the information you provided today um, was to everyone. So thank you. And I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but uh, we really appreciate, you know, all of the time you gave us today, Dr. Fader. So thank you so much for being here and thank for you. this extremely informative program. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we hope that you please take a moment at the end to fill out the survey. Uh, the survey will pop up in the browser uh, when the webinar ends, but we'll also send a link. There will be a link sent out in a follow-up email. So please send us, please take that survey. We really look at your feedback and use it to try to improve our program. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you again, Dr. Fader. Thank you, everyone.